Right. Can everybody see the screen? Morning. Yes. So let me um, just give you a brief um, update on what's been happening in terms of here on the Columbia campus and in the hospital in terms of um, clinical trials um, enrolling participants with um, COVID-19 disease. Okay, so just by um, kind of wave, wave of introductions, we've largely been focusing on large randomized NIH initiated or multi-center national studies in order to sort of look at rapid clinically and virologically relevant endpoints. But I think equally important are these sort of smaller and scientifically um, important studies that are relevant, either sort of ask questions that are a little bit more nimble, may not be possible to ask in the context of of these larger trials and that are particularly relevant for our populations. Um, so there's a, there's, sort of, there's a great interest in, in, in exploring those as well, of course. What I wanted to tell you about is just sort of dividing kind of these um, um, clinical trial approaches into two categories. One is looking at in direct antivirals um, and then immune modulating agents. The two examples I'll give you today are studies that are actually already, that have been um, launched and implemented at our medical center. Um, and the antiviral category is remdesivir and then L6 receptor block blocker, sarilumab. So let's talk about um, remdesivir, the um, um, uh, uh, drug that targets um, the viral RNA polymerase. Um, and it's being evaluated in individuals with moderate or severe um, coronavirus disease. And the site um, team, the sort of the local team here at our institution that's leading it, it's being led by Max O'Donnell from, from pulmonary. And um, it's a nice collaboration between pulmonary division and infectious diseases, as well as many other individuals. Let me tell you a little bit about kind of the design of this study. So it's, um, I mentioned that it's a um, sort of a two-pronged approach. There are actually two separate clinical trials. The first one looking at moderate individuals with moderate disease um, who are randomized into, into three groups. Um, those are, and I'll tell you in a minute how we define moderate disease. The randomization is into three treatment groups, um, the two different courses of uh, duration of courses of remdesivir, five days versus 10 days. Um, the drug is given intravenously with a large loading, larger loading dose, followed by smaller dose um, to complete the course. And the third arm is just a standard of care um, that continues. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in terms of the severe um, um, sort of indication for remdesivir in terms of the severe clinical group, again, it's a randomized open label in this case study of remdesivir where individuals are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive um, either a shorter course or longer course of remdesivir, again, intravenously. So this is for hospitalized um, inpatients. And again, there's just two arms, um, no standard of care or um, arm in this in individuals with severe disease. So how do we define severe versus moderate disease um, in this particular instance? So patients um, fall into the moderate category if um, they have um, oxygenation status that's above 94% on room air and presence of um, infiltrates on chest x-ray. It's a pretty broad, broad category. And just sort of as a side note, I should note that many of those patients are actually not, um, oftentimes are being managed at home. Minority of them are, um, um, are being admitted to the hospital um, with, uh, with such a profile. And sort of usually it's the presence of comorbidities that sort of dictates of whether or not they're going to be admitted. So that's the moderate disease category. In terms of severe disease, um, individuals are, again, all of them are about adults. Um, they have to have documented SARS-CoV-2 infection within four days of enrollment, and their oxygenation has to be less than 94% on room air or requirement for supplemental oxygenation or intubation um, being on ECMO. So right now, the study was launched just a couple of days ago here on this campus, um, and we've been focusing and Max has been focusing on looking for those individuals who are actually on um, invasive mechanical ventilation who are intubated um, and they have to have a presence of um, infiltrates on, on chest x-ray. Um, in terms of exclusion um, criteria that are important to note, and um, we've sort of combined them on one slide here so you can see them side by side. 
uh, for individuals who are in the moderate category uh, versus the severe clinical category. So right off the bat, um, just sort of something to note is that participation in any other clinical trial um, um, or concurrent use uh, with another direct antiviral, concurrent use of another direct antiviral um, agent um, uh, within 24 hours prior of randomization or concurrently um, is um, disallowed. Um, for the moderate category, we clearly do not want individuals who are um, vented, who are ventilated, um, and then liver and, and kidney function um, can be exclusionary if they are impaired. Um, and individuals in the severe category, again, the you know, co-enrollment in another clinical trial is, is not permitted. And also um, a concurrent administration of hydroxychloroquine or protease inhibitors um, for other indication is also um, disallowed. The likewise um, presence of multi-organ failure is also an exclusion criterion. Um, and um, mechanical ventilation for more than five days um, is also an exclusionary criterion, as is abnormal liver function and abnormal uh, renal function. So that, that was uh, remdesivir. I mentioned that the study has just launched here at our center just a couple of days ago. It's been um, ongoing for a little bit longer at, at um, other medical centers so much so that um, the um, remdesivir study sort of reached a, um, sort of a landmark enrollment of over 400 participants in the US. So um, the, it was expanded um, to 2,400 um, individuals and, and we're enrolling actively here at Columbia um, and uh, I know that the um, drug manufacturer is actually sort of interested in, in collecting the data expeditiously and swiftly in order to um, analyze it and present it um, to the FDA. Um, let me, so those, that's kind of the antiviral that's currently being tested for hospitalized patients in a, um, in a clinical trial. Let me now turn to the other approach that I mentioned in terms of sort of immune modulation. Um, and that's sort of, there's one study I wanted to highlight that we also started just uh, several days ago, and that's evaluating cerilumab. Um, so looking at the, uh, it's a double-blinded placebo-controlled study that's looking at the safety and efficacy of this agent for patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. And again, it's a, it's a collaboration between um, infectious diseases and uh, pulmonary allergy and critical care. So just a, a note about cerilumab. I think as many of you know, it's an IL-6 receptor. It's a monoclonal antibody against the IL-6 receptor. And the hypothesis that's sort of driving um, this um, sort of investigating this agent as well as other IL-6 receptor blockers is really sort of thinking about the kind of mortality and morbidity that's heightened mortality and morbidity that's um, associated uh, with the inflammatory response and kind of cascade that's triggered uh, by the virus and overwhelming sort of cytokine response, almost akin to cytokine storm and macrophage activation syndrome. Um, and the hypothesis is that um, L6 can be a sort of modifiable driver of uh, progression of the disease in these patients with severe and uh, critical COVID-19 disease. There are um, data that have emerged um, uh, from sort of recently from, from Chinese, um, from cohorts in, in China um, that have evaluated uh, tocilizumab, um, so another IL-6 receptor blocker that have um, in a non-randomized um, fashion um, that may sort of suggest that there may be some some clinical be benefit after tocilizumab administration. Um, again, this study didn't have a placebo arm, but what the authors noted was there was improvement kind of in the appearance of the chest CTs, resolution of, of fever um, after administration of tocilizumab, and also improvement in inflammatory markers. But data are, are gathering, and again, it's important to evaluate these strategies in the setting of um, of sort of placebo controlled trials, or at least studies that are looking at um, standard of care in, in the background. So an effort to- Magda, just a reminder, you're almost out of time. Sure. So here, let me just speed through. So we have our, um, this is the design of the phase two slash three um, study that's looking at this agent. Severe disease, again, is individuals who need um, oxygen supplementation, but just through O2. And critical disease is individuals who are actually ventilated vented on ECMO or on renal replacement therapy. 
Um, and again, sort of concurrent use of antiviral agents is allowed as long as they're administered in an open label uh, fashion. Uh, presence of bacterial or fungal infections is, um, needs to be evaluated because um, IL-6 receptor blocker can um, cause um, 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 sort of uh, exacerbation of those. And the primary and uh, endpoints are outlined here in terms of resolution of fever and improvement in clinical endpoints. I just want to briefly mention that hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil is also being evaluated as post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's an investigator-initiated study uh, by Lizzie Olsner. Um, she's evaluating the efficacy of this approach in an outpatient setting for individuals who've been, um, who are close contacts, who are asymptomatic close contacts of patients with COVID-19. Um, in terms of future and potential studies, um, there are um, sort of looking at antivirals. There is an NIH and ACTG large network study that will start looking, evaluating hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin in, patient, in outpatients with mild disease, as well as in inpatients with moderate slash severe disease. Um, other antivirals that we're sort of looking at is Favirpavir, um, which is an anti-influenza drug that's approved in Japan. Um, and there was a study that was launched in Japan evaluating this agent in COVID-19. And then we've been in communication with investigators here in the US about starting that trial here at Columbia. Other immune modulating agents um, um, are also being looked at, such as tocilizumab. There's sort of this exploration of mesenchymal stem cells, JAK inhibitors, and then the issue of convalescent plasma, I think that Ian uh, was raising in terms of looking at that in a, in a, um, in a systematic fashion uh, in severe and mild moderate disease or as prophylaxis. And sort of the first steps of identifying individuals who could potentially donate um, has been initiated. And I know that Dr. Hard will, will talk about that a little bit later. Let me pause. Um, and see if there are any questions. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, so this is Sabi Marka from Physics. And uh, I'm curious about how you manage uh, clinical trials with uh, cocktails. Uh, there are uh, proposals uh, for using uh, multiple uh, drug combinations. Um, and uh, how do you manage that? So in terms of um, evaluating them in a clinical trial, sort of in the, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, right, right now, so the studies that we're doing currently are just sort of evaluating these single strategies. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think it's quite possible that you're going to need more than one other antiviral, maybe an antiviral in combination with immune modulating agent. We haven't, we we haven't implemented any of these studies here yet. Um, I guess the other question um, that you're sort of asking is how do you evaluate, uh, you know, when our standard of care actually involves administration of, of agents such as azithromycin or hydroxychloroquine, which are being used off label. So how do you evaluate the efficacy of an agent like remdesivir in the background of standard of care, which may include these other agents? And you're right, it's, it's challenging and I think that's sort of why the sample size of those studies has to be adjusted in order to sort of see an effect size that could be you know be above and beyond sort of to distinguish um, the efficacy of something like remdesivir above and beyond background activity of, of other drugs. I hope I addressed your question. And there's also I should note it is not easy conducting these clinical trials <laughs> in the midst of a raging, raging uh, pandemic and, and, you know, in, in New York, the epicenter of, of it here in the US. And there are a lot of issues that come up with in terms of approaching participants, consenting them, working with families and teams to do so. So it's actually sort of, you know, there are kind of challenges that we anticipated, but not quite to the extent. So doing these studies well, um, not only designing them well, but executing them well is actually, um, is, is important. Um, and, and we've, been, we've been able to do so, but cannot be taken for granted. Thank you very much. This was very helpful. And I, I totally expect that uh, cocktails will play uh, some role in the future, especially mitigating side effects at high dosage and such. I completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. 
Um, this is Lisa Hark. I have a question. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm director of the clinical trials unit in the Department of Ophthalmology. Oh no. Hi, Lisa. I think you um, accidentally muted yourself. I can't hear you anymore. Uh, I'm Vishal Mishra from Computer Science. I had a question. Uh, sure. So I've been uh, in the last couple of years working a lot on the theory and application of synthetic control. Do you have any interest in augmenting your clinical trials with synthetic control or doing synthetic control based trials? Sorry, I don't know if I, synthetic. Synthetic control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, let's, let's, why don't you reach out? Let's talk about it. I think we yeah. are, we have sort of a, you know, kind of a clinical kind of, We've assembled a clinical trials working group that sort of draws on multidisciplinary expertise of people from the from the school just to sort of really critically think about not only how to, you know, I think um, how to sort of initiate these investigator and um, some smaller studies that are maybe a little bit more nimble and can look at, yeah. at questions that are um, um, that are that can be answered really quickly. So let's let's chat. Yeah. So yeah, my uh, I'm going to manage the question, please. Uh, I'll, I'll ask people to speak. So Richard Axel has a question. Yes, uh, Magda, how many patients can be treated with convalescent sera from an individual donor? So the um, so it's three essentially. So the, every donor can donate up to sort of three doses. Um, um, that can then be administered sort of a, um, to, a, to a particular individual um, in, a, in a setting, in a clinical setting, just in terms of the volume that's being, uh, being uh, collected. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Oh, thank you. Um, I uh, manage 12 full-time clinical research coordinators, and we have, they're all working remotely at home on various things, and I was heard yesterday from our team and Dr. Chaffee that, um, you may need some help and we may be able to deploy some of our coordinators. And so I just wanted to see if there was any role for uh, remote um, going into Epic and helping you extract the data in an expeditious fashion like you were asking yeah. or we can I, help with IRB. Yes, I don't know if you can hear me nodding, but the answer yes. is sounding yes. I think it's this is gonna Take a true village. I've said it many times before in different contexts, but now more than ever, actually. So thank you for saying that. And we've um, the the dean's office has actually been sort of wonderful, um, and, and clinical trials office has been wonderful in mobilizing, sort of identifying individuals who could help. So yes, um, that would be okay. So Bonnie Wang, I'll submit their names, and then uh, we'll direct them to you, and we're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. So Miles Richardson. And then I think we'll have to stop and move on to the next talk. M Miles? I think whatever, whoever is MPR2144. Uh, that's Murdoch Ali. Can you hear me? Oh, Mar okay. Mm -hmm. um, Magda, very nice and very impressive. And congratulations on getting things going so fast. Part of it is just relating to coordination and services. Um, and first, just to say <clears throat> that the CTSA has a couple of services that may be useful to you on the trials front. Uh, the BIRD unit. Sorry, Mirda, uh, Magda, could you please stop sharing so the next person can share the presentation? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mirda. Um, so the BIRD unit, uh, which is basically run by Xing Li and Mailman Biostats for the CTSA, is a expert in adaptive clinical trial designs and efficient clinical trial designs. So if she, that unit's not involved, they work with the cancer center and also they can provide resources uh, that comes from the CTSA for as part of what we can do. The second is we have a trial innovation network with Mitch Elkin runs and can help locally and on the national front. So just Mitch Elkin on the trial innovation network, Xing Li on the biostats. And I am wondering if there is some central process of coordination of the trial activities. I, I know Steve Shea has been heavily involved, but I think it'd be useful to share what's going on to organize the trial efforts um, in a coordinated manner so people can reach out in a coordinated way yeah. to you and others. So, so that would be very helpful to share moving forward. And, but thank you, super work. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone.